I think that when it comes to, you know, a lot of creative departments like that, whether it be Crunchyroll or Netflix or Viz uh, or Amazon, I think that I would like to hope that all of them are like, no, we want entertainment by human beings. And they're having people from all over and it's just incredible. Then I see like, you know, some of these AI things and I'm like, no, I don't, there's no replacing this stuff that is made by all these hardworking, dedicated, extremely skilled human beings. Hello and welcome to Culturescape, the show that interviews the geek creators and influencers that built nerd culture. I'm your host, Peter Pischke, and today I have a very special guest. He's an independent animator, a video game designer, a YouTuber and news ground pioneer. He's one of my favorite all-time voice actors. He's Christopher Neosi, a.k.a. Kurt Buffer, the voice of Reagan Arataka from Mob Psycho 100. That's probably like one of my top three voice acting delivery performance of all time, so I'm excited. Aww. And uh, Conrad well, Leto in the recent Black Clover film. He's the creator of Tome, uh, the terrain of magical expertise, which is an animated web series and video game. I know, it's a lot. Uh, in this episode, we're going to dive into Chris's journey as an artist, as a performer, his inspirations, his influences, his achievements of future projects and plans. I'm sure if you love Chris's work, you want to learn more about how uh, the creative process between animation and voice acting goes, then today you're in for a treat. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Chris. Thank you. Wow, what a what a start. Um, I'm going to be that guy only because it's a common thing with me, and uh, it's it's pronounced herbifer. It's like Christopher, except Kirbyer. Oh, I made it when that I makes, was. That I, makes it sense, was my actually. screen name I made when I was like 12 years old on AOL Instant Messenger. If anybody remembers what that is, uh, but uh, but no, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for uh, for reaching out. Yeah, I know. You know, you, I I think I've been saying that name for as long as I knew who you were. So it's like wow, 10 years. You just solve it. But you know what? More importantly, you also pronounced Neosi correctly because I get. Noisy and nosy, you know, which of both of which I am. I mean, you know, granted, but uh, yeah, that's, I, I signed up for this. But uh, yeah, so no, I'm I'm happy to be here. Thanks, thanks so much for uh, for bringing me on your show. Yeah, no, it's great to have you. I saw you recently also on uh, Pipkin Pippa, and that was a fascinating interview. And you were so kind oh, yeah. to bring come on. <laughs> that was the uh, that yeah, that was an interesting like. 48 hours of, of a Twitter interaction and then a, her crash at a stream and then me getting interviewed. And it was, yeah, she's, she's a, she's a funny little bunny, that one. <laughs> yeah, no, she's great. She's about the only VTuber I, I actually will like watching. I'm not, that's not really my thing, but that, that is a crowd that you, you are good at tapping into. This even goes back to when you started. Cause like from everything I read, you pretty much got started as like a young mid to young teenager on news ground in 2004 and you're about my age so you're what like 15 16 at most yeah i was uh what when i well i'd first heard about new grounds when i was well probably like 13 or 14 um i i had become uh, well i'd been introduced to flash animation first with uh homestar runner and uh, strong bad emails and all that stuff a, a buddy of mine nice. showed that uh on my birthday we had, had a bunch of my friends over and said you got you got to see this funny web cartoon thing. I was, oh, it's hysterical. No, what did they make this? It looks a little different than the other cartoons you think. And then um, I remember actually I was telling, I was telling kind of my like on again, off again, like cool bully slash sometimes friend in like middle school. Like, oh, you see Homestar Runner? He's like, oh yeah, Newgrounds is better. And I'm like, what is Newgrounds? And so I went there and I discovered all the early stuff by guys like uh, Joey Blanchett, Legendary Frog, uh, uh, John and Richie, the Zerbs brothers, the Super Flash brothers. You know, a lot of these guys I've, I'd gone on to work with later and, you know, become friends with and stuff. They're great people. Um, and uh, I got really intrigued by it. And then I, I took a class in 2004, I think it was, to learn uh, how to work with Flash back when it was Macromedia before Adobe uh, uh, kind of scooped it up. Yeah, that, that and, just dates you a little bit. Oh yeah, yeah. No, this is a long time ago. I was, I think the first version I used was like MX two thousand four Flash and Fireworks. I didn't even have Photoshop yet. It was very rudimentary stuff. But I picked it up, and I, I uh, at the time, I really wanted to make games, and learned very quickly that uh, programming was not a fun thing for me to do at all. So I was like, I'll make movies instead. 
And that led to wanting to do animation. And then I went to college to do it. I went to the School of Visual Arts in New York City, um, did that for four years. The voiceover stuff kind of happened along the way. Um, and I made a lot of amazing friends in the arts and in the acting world that uh, have helped me with all these projects that I've done and things I've gotten to be in. And it's been quite a ride. And now here I am, 34 years old. And, and uh, I've done, a, I mean, from your intro, I've, I've done a little bit of everything. I've done a whole lot of stuff. And, uh, and, I, and I, there's a lot more that I want to do. And I love every second of it. So, Well, hopefully, I think more will be in your future. I, you're really great because I think the Internet age brought in a lot of people, especially near the content creation space where you are taking part in all kinds of industries and that that is a talent because not everyone can juggle multiple balls not everyone can try to be in in all the different spaces I, it's fascinating to me that you got big on newsgram because that was you know i remember when online content stuff that you could watch for video streaming and enjoy that was just around that time we're talking about like 2004 2005 yeah because what youtube kind of uh i think started right around me. Was it maybe 2005 was when yeah, YouTube it was, started? Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Um, and I didn't hop on YouTube until a little bit later because I had this like, no, I'm a Newgrounds guy specifically. And then, you know, there was a whole thing with that. And that, that blip was a thing back then too. Yep. You know, or there's all these kind of alternatives. That was, that, yeah, that was a whole nightmare a lot of people had to deal with. And, um, and even, excuse me, in the last probably like, I don't know, 10 years or so, um, I have mainly been, in terms of having the majority of my stuff, I'm mainly a YouTube guy because um, just just out of convenience, just because you can't can't beat the convenience of YouTube, you know, for better or worse. Not that it's a perfect platform, as I'm sure many people will tell you, but um, I don't know. I, I enjoy having my stuff on there. I, I enjoy streaming. I enjoy doing shorts and stuff, you know, TikTok type stuff, and um, you know, and then when I have you know like like a bigger scale kind of project like Tom or otherwise. Uh, you know, just there it goes and everybody sees it and et cetera. That and also wanting to avoid people just posting my stuff without my permission on other places anyway, which was a thing back then too. And uh, eventually I tried to circumvent that as best as I could. So, <laughs> oh yeah, no, that was, that was, uh, that was the pre Twitter thing where like a person with like a hundred thousand followers steals like uh, a tweet thread from like a guy with 12. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, well, even, I mean, recently, like, um, as I'm sure a lot of you folks know, that we have the, uh, the Super Mario RPG remake happening. And so tons of people were very kindly, like, thinking of me because of the uh, the Rawest Forest music video that I did all the way back in 2007. When I was in high school. I did that as, like, one of my uh, school projects. I, I did it in a week, and it became hyper viral. And I was pointing out that, like, you know, that really hit big. Uh, I put it on Newgrounds, but it hit really big on YouTube and on uh, Nico Nico Doga, which is a big Japanese uh, video site. It's kind of a YouTube sort of alternative for, for, for uh, Japan. And um, and it was so it was kind of, it went kind of viral from other people taking it. It had my name on it. So people knew it was me. Thank God. Um, but uh, yeah. And then, you know, uh, uh oh and, and then somebody just like oh, when mario rpg was trending because there were rumors oh there might be a remake or something and somebody just put ross forest up without asking on twitter just as a video file no tagging no credit no nothing and i'm like yep history repeats itself and then the next morning the remake got announced and then everybody was my phone was blowing up. My Twitter channel was blowing up, and I'm just like, "Wow!" Well, you know what? It all works out. So <laughs> no, that's no, that's great. You're just like you've been keeping the faith. You you were like one of the most hardcore Super Mario RPG fans I can think of. You were like you were like in the wilderness with the candle. You were just waiting for someone to come <laughs> and take the Olympic flame. I mean, uh, well, you know what? For for years, I was like, maybe at best, maybe at best, we'll get Gino and Smash or something. You know, someday. Because I, I really had, I, like, I dreamed of a Mario RPG remake, but I'm like, it's so, it, it's such a, you know, niche little thing. What's the, what the, what's the, uh, there was even a recent idea that I had, I think, like, as, as, like, the beginning of this year about what if they did it as, like, a Mario and Luigi game? Like, they had Luigi as an extra party member and you have the team attacks. And now we're getting, and it even kind of seems like on that trailer that we might be getting team attacks with the characters anyway. And I'm like, oh my God. Oh, this is this is a dream come true, you know. Um, so I'm really excited to play it. It'll be, you know, obviously, 
be about a half a year or so until it's out, but uh, it's it's exciting. So yeah, I hope it's good. Hey, Square has a pretty good. They have a pretty good track record lately for the remakes. So I yeah, I, I don't have, know I if it's Square them. making it though. Uh, we actually don't even know who the developer. Is. I mean, obviously it's Nintendo, you know, mm. publishing it, but yeah. we don't know who is doing the game yet. Uh, I don't know if it's Square Enix. I know that um, uh, Chihiro-san, the the original director of the game, who's on Twitter, I think that he said, "Hey, I'm not involved with it, but I can't wait to see it. It looks like it's going to be great." Uh, so yeah, no, there's a, there's a lot. There's a lot that I'm I'm very excited uh, to see about when that project finally hits. So. Yeah, we're working through your your CV, what you've been working on, all the different people you've done projects with. Maybe a little jealous because I was like, what was I doing in 2005? I know I well, it wasn't <laughs> anything nearly as productive. When I was on, when I thought of Newsground, this is how it was out here in South Dakota. It was the place we went to after after we were in the uh, the keyboard classes. Yeah, there were typing classes and that was still around at that point. And then afterwards, for like 20 minutes, everyone would just hop on news ground and then play whatever was there. They might yeah. see the videos or they might play like I play a lot of like lifesaver branded like pool and mini golf, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, Newgrounds was um, banned pretty quickly on uh, my school server in, in that era. Um, a lot of those hot sites, people were just like, nope, the, the, the staff were just you know, block them off of the, uh, the, the school's internet. So, you know, that was, that was where I went after school was I would go home and I would, you know, be living on the internet since, you know, probably about 2002 or three was when I was really getting big into that. It's funny, even, um, like in, I was just talking to somebody about this the other day in, uh, in Tome in my, my series, um, there are these characters, the net Kings who are like the, the creators of the virtual world, you know, kind of MMORPG thing that the characters are hanging out with. And, um, Unlike the characters, which were mostly based on people that I knew off of like the internet, like my earliest people that I met online, the Net Kings were all based on the earliest websites that I went to. So I'd be going to like Super Mario 128 Central, which was like the site that popularized like the, the Luigi is in Mario 64 rumor thing that was like that was super viral early on. Um, Kirby's Rainbow Resort game trailers. Um, God, you know, like Konzenshu, which was our Daizenshu back then. It was a big Dragon Ball site. Um, you know, a lot of stuff like that that I was just way, way into. And, uh, you know, so when I go to, on the computer at like my dad's like office of work or something and, you know, became really fascinated and, and the internet is the, the best and worst thing that's ever happened to me all at once, really. So. I, you know, this is something I don't think the, the, the latest generation of gamers that, you know, it's part of the, it's part of the, the major culture it's very normalized i mean there's still some people who give you trash or are complaining about but it isn't like it used to be back in the day though when you and i were kids and teens like getting accurate information about a video game was sometimes difficult like i remember yeah i remember a friend josh josh me about like you could play pokemon yellow and there is a truck there is a truck sitting but you have to do like these really elaborate steps to find it and we we're like this is how you unlock Mew three and this is, it was just like all kinds oh of ridiculous God. garbage. Yeah, I remember all that stuff. Yeah, to the point where this is funny. I remember I was looking back on some of the old. I used to collect a massive amount of Pokemon stuff. I was I'm mean, still a huge fan. That was my very first voiceover gig was working on Pokemon in 2009. I did I did that show and um, I remember uh, what like uh, the early early like first few gold and silver Gen two Pokemon were being kind of slowly um, you know teased and everything. And everybody saw Meryl, and they were like, "Oh, it's it's Pika Blue." Yes. And literally, yes. there was like, uh, I th not not the not the official um, the trading card game, but there was like a like an alternate. It was like Tops, like a baseball card brand, and they did Pokemon cards that were mostly just like screenshots from like episodes of the show or the movie. And um, the uh, Mewtwo Strikes Back, the movie had not come out in the U.S. yet, and they had uh, in in. They had some of the Gen 2 Pokemon tees, a little bit. Meryl was one of them. And literally, there is an official piece of, of Pokemon merchandise that calls Meryl Pika Blue. Uh, there, if you if you really dig for that, you can find that. It's just, I mean, is it was, that, it is that like a collector's a, item someone has? It's and like... very well might be. Yeah, I mean, there's just that. It was just a wild west of things back then. And I remember, like, yeah, a lot of those early early Pokemon sites, Cerebi.net, I've, I've been going to for probably 20 years of my life at this point. You know, and other ones that I'm sure are long gone by now. And I remember like printing out pictures of 
of Ho O that we knew as Golden Bird back then, and Togepi was new. It was the new you know hot thing at that time. Yeah, it was it was interesting. Yeah, two thousand early two thousands and late nineties internet was a, a very strange beast to uh, uh, to tame, I guess. Yeah, I imagine whoever has that card that's like because you hear this all the time for owning certain comic books with like rare covers or uh, uh -huh. certain cards are like this is my retirement but you know there's some poor fool that paid fifty thousand for the peak of <laughs> oh my god uh, so uh you went there from a teenage by the way how did that affect you i've, I've always kind of wanted to know how did getting that big that young affect you because like i even if i'm in my 30s and if i have a successful project i sometimes struggle like i, I, I contextualizing it handling it like, I can't imagine if I found success as a teenager. That would have been, that would just, I don't know. Well, You're a better man than first, me in that way. <laughs> my first um, big successful thing that I did on Newgrounds, on the internet in general, uh, was uh, this thing called uh, the Super Freaking Parody Ranger, which was, of course, it was a Power Rangers parody. And that was, that was, um, that was an era, that was definitely a learning era for me because I remember I was doing, um, TV Tome Adventures, which was kind of the very first incarnation of Tome, and it was all just me telling a story and trying to make, like, you know, an anime-emulated kind of, you know, thing, right? And so I was doing that, and, and then I, I was seeing a lot of my peers and people I looked up to getting, like, really popular, millions of views, and I'm like, I'm 17 or, you know, whatever, and I want that. Like, I want popular... And it wasn't... It's funny, it wasn't about making money. It was about just popularity and respect, you know? So I did parody rangers because um it was inspired by an old clip that um uh, aaron hansen did uh, it was just like making fun of power like you know mighty Morphin power rangers and i thought it was funny so i had him do a bunch of voices on and i worked chris ito and edwin chong and kira buckland and a bunch of folks um on that a lot of a lot of people who are now working in voiceover professionally and um i did this thing because i thought well no one there's all these video game parodies but nobody's done a power rangers parody except for like the Mighty Martian Emo Rangers on MySpace. That was the thing. If anybody knows what that is, you're cool. And, and ancient. But I, I was trying to capitalize on an open market, basically, on something that hadn't been done before. And, uh, and that was something where, like, I really shifted my, my uh, motivation to that. And on one hand, as a kid, I was just excited to do stuff and to get attention and to, to have people like what I was doing. And to have more than the very niche, very small audience of TTA uh, watching it, like I wanted to expand my audience. Um, but at the same time, I think that, that was all. And I've talked about this a lot on like in other interviews and a lot of my own videos where it's like that was a very like, you know, selfishly, you know, not the greatest type of motivation. But when you're young and, you know, you're just kind of going through life and letting whatever guide you guide you, uh, you know, that's what I did. And then I wised up by the time I was getting through college. And I was like, you know what, this type of stuff is not what I want to be doing forever. I don't want to be doing parodies and, you know, video game, you know, tribute stuff. It's fun to do, you know, mm -hmm. and I'd I, 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 like, I, like, because that's the difference between, say, like, with the Mario RPG music videos. Like, those are things that are just pure passion. Like, I love that game and I just want to make something to express how much I love it, you know. Um, and the fact that it became popular, like, in, as a result, like, well, that, that's the bonus, you know. Um, and now, you know, what I really care about is, uh, well, it's actually, it's ironic is I do really care about making money because, you know, I got to eat, uh, <laughs> certainly, but, yeah, um, true. no, I, I, but, but I, but I care more than anything about just making something that is, uh, positively influential and inspiring and, and cool and memorable and entertaining to people. You know, it's not about pacing trends. And if I'm doing that, then it's like very simple, you know, like like curve blocks, like little quick like videos or shorts and things that I can do in two seconds. But that isn't like a passion project. It's just a little content. So. Yeah, part of the content factory we now all have to be. Oh, yeah. No, and I, I would spin that, though, that I would say that seeking out popularity, it may not be just like, I guess that's kind of like almost an American high school kind of think that's kind of how we think of popular but i would say it's also you want you built something lovingly and you would want it to be appreciated i know that's how it's for me i want my projects to do as well as i can but it's not really because i want people to like me per se maybe there is some of that i mean i'll be honest but i mean i definitely well in in that same area you were talking about i mean yeah i wanted to be friends with all the 
the guys that were, you know, the big wigs and stuff. And I, and I did eventually get to know, and you know what, admittedly, even, you know, at that time when I was young and stupid and overeager and, and, uh, and came off uh, a big thing that, that I, that I regret of that time was that I came off as very arrogant to people. Um, I've never had, I mean, I, I feel confident and proud of, of the work that I do for the most part, but I don't feel like up, you know, my own butt about what I do. I don't consider myself like, you know, some kind of like savant or, or God of what I do. I, no, I don't have that. I don't have that in me. I don't have like an egotistical thing about me, but I came off that way a lot in my annoyingness and over eagerness and, and, you know, petulance and everything. Mm -hmm. And that rubbed some people that were you know, my, my colleagues, uh, the wrong way. Um, but there were other people that I'm still friends to this day. Like I think of guys like, um, happy Harry, uh, and the super flash brothers and, and guys like that, that I met during that time that I think understood that like I was an over eager, an over eager kid because also we were all jerks, you know, I, like actually Chris O'Neill and Zach Hadel, who now are, are friends as well. I, I saw Chris for, for dinner, like a you know a month or two ago. Um, and we've worked together on, on various yeah, things. Yeah, it's like, the you know, there was a time. Guys. Oh, yeah. Like, uh, there was a time where we were like, like at each other, like in like, you know, reviews and just, you know, our fans kind of feuding. And then we just kind of woke up at like sometime in our mid 20s and we're just like, this is stupid. Sorry. Like, I'm sorry too. You want to hang out and high five and be friends? And then we did. You know, you, you grow up after a while. <laughs> so, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, that, uh, so, um, I'm trying to think of the term, but, you know, scientists have shown that. The, the stage of the brain development for males for your frontal cortex, which is what helps control um, your urges, it, it's basically what allows you to pass the marshmallow test. That doesn't develop till much <laughs> later <laughs> than <laughs> ladies. It's like mid twenties, and for some people, it's even later. So, I, and then here's the thing: I I think for you, I've watched enough and I've listened to enough of you. I think we're similar in personality. Do you ever watch? Do you watch One Piece, by the way? You're, oh, you're I, One Piece I adore, fan? I adore okay, One Piece. Okay, so yeah, you will get absolutely. this analogy. So in One Piece, there's the character of Brooke, who's my favorite One Piece character by far because Ian Yo, Sinclair ho, ho. is he's, he's really brilliant. good in that role. He's genius. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Well, it, Brooke's problem, though, and I think Oda, this is tr true in the manga, he handles it so well, is Brooke, because he was socially isolated for so long, he doesn't understand a lot of how his mannerisms and how he behaves reflects on other people. And then and the Straw Hats, they know he means well and they understand it, so they get it. But other people may not. And I think that's true for, for a lot. You know, I I spent most of my teens and my 20s, you know, I come from an abusive single family household situation. So most of that time when I wasn't doing school, I was, you know, trying to help take care of my siblings. So the problem is, though, as an adult. And I even try to do journalistic projects or I try to hang out with other people who are into journalism. I, I still have some of that. I still have some of that, like that social isolation, that um, inability to know when I come off sounding um, ego or arrogant. So I don't blame you at all for having that problem. I think a lot of people actually do. I just don't think it's I don't think people are really comfortable getting into it. And that's not that's not a huge focus, but I just want you to know I don't think you should be so hard on yourself necessarily. Well, no, you know what? It, it's happen. it's it's not to be hard on oneself. I think it's to know your root. I think that because especially like as someone who did basically grow up on the internet, and as a lot of my you know my friends and, and colleagues have, you know, it, it's um it's a very weird thing where like it's like everything that you do and say is chronicled in some way. And, and like it, it, it's stamped in some place on the information superhighway at its archive somewhere, even if you think it isn't. And um, so the person that you were one year, three years, five years, 10 years, 20 years ago, like, you know, if, you know, even, you know people change identities. I never felt the need to do that personally. Um, but, uh, but it's all there. And I think that, I think that the good and bad side of that is it's like, well, you know, you get reminded of like, yeah, that was, that was who I was back then. But it's also like, you know what, but I'm not that anymore. And yeah, I'm, I'm and no I, longer I'm, 15. I grow, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Now I'm, now I'm not, I'm not Kerber for, even though that's my YouTube uh, screen name is Kerber for 15. Cause I made it when I was 15 and now I'm Kerber for uh, Kerber for 34 at this point. So uh, maybe I'll get, maybe I'll reach uh, Kerber for 150. I'll just, I'll, I'll tap the zero on if I live a really healthy life. It would be funny though if your career was like mirrored. So like you kind of started making the news ground cartoons, it, and, and there was very, that that was two thousands era humor. Some of it, uh -huh. and then it's like the arc of your career. It goes really high, and then before you die, you're back to news ground. Yeah, new grounds will somehow uh, 
resurface again and actually become more popular than any other video site. Yes. And that'll be because you know what? What I will say is it's still it's active. The long play. It's uh it's still active. And and what I can still appreciate about Newgrounds is the fact that like it is it's because the the whole kind of subtitle of it is is Newgrounds. Everything by everyone. And it's freedom. It's a, anybody could post music, art, animation, games, you know, writing, anything. It's all there. And uh, and I really loved that. And, and Tom Fulp and all the staff uh, over at Philly, who I haven't seen in a long time, um, you know, they, they made something really special that I think is a really, really important part uh, of Internet history, you know. And uh, and I learned a lot there. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm I'm happy with, you know, most of what I did back then. Uh, and uh, but I'm happier also doing what I'm doing now as well. Oh, and you're you're very good at it. Um, one thing I think, and I would like voice acting is the main thing I love you for. Uh, Reagan Arataka is one of my favorite performances. I think in uh, English. I know, I know, but it, you, it, it's just, and that's you know, it's obviously a big reason because that character is written so well. Uh -huh. um, the ADR director, whoever put together the script, all of it is just perfect. But also your delivery. Yeah. I think you give like. You get a you give a delivery of a very cocky but surefire kind of uh, upper baritone. Big, big Jim Carrey energy was what yeah. I brought to to that role for sure. And um, I I think it's fantastic. So when you agreed to come on, I was like, oh, that's so exciting. So, but one thing I do like you, and and this is something I wish people who don't who don't work in media who don't create content is like so much of your time is is devoted to networking so much of your time is like trying to connect with other people and it's almost this no-win situation where it's like you you have to behave a certain way otherwise people people won't like you but at the same time you also be careful because it's like will they let you in the the, the inner circle into the inner click and wow. and what you i know what you are really good at because this is true of home it's like you have all these pretty well to do either their content creators or the people in animation and that I being someone that's worked in media I know that is a, a particular skill and I know a lot of people who want to get into media or content creation struggle to understand that can you give us a little insight like is that something naturally you're very good at or or what's your philosophy when you're trying to network or maybe it's just just totally organic and they're like oh you're my friend let's do this you know well it, it is certainly a bit of that you know I think that um well, in entertainment, I think a lot of people talk about like, oh, it's all nepotism. It's all who you know. And 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 I think that that like it's that's true. But I think that's also a very cynical way of looking at it, because like I think that it is sometimes not even just friendship. Sometimes it's also a level of like uh, admiration for someone else. Um, you know, I, I've uh, I've been recommended and, um, you know, given opportunities by people that uh, like as sometimes I've never met before or people that I, that I only know very vaguely, but they know of my work. Um, I've done the same for some people that I've, you know, hardly met, but like, because, you know, a lot of people know I'm kind of a walking, talking, like encyclopedia of voiceover stuff. So like, I know who, like, I know who everybody is. And a lot of them, I also know personally to some level. Um, not everybody, everybody, but like, you know, I, I love that. I love that kind of stuff. And the rare times I get to cast, uh, you know, projects and things. Um, I was actually just helping somebody cast, uh, something like about a month ago. And, um, and there were, there were people in that case where I'm like, you know what, I've never worked with this person, but I love their work and they should be part of this project, you know, kind of thing like that. So, um, but as far as my own way of doing that, I know it's going to sound very simplistic, but it's really as simple as just like, I ask people. And usually they say yes. There's very, very few people that um, I've reached out to about, hey, I'd love to work with you on this. And they'll be like, oh, I'm not interested. Or, oh, I don't have time. Or, oh, sorry, I can't do this. Like, it's very rare. Most people, ones that I'm shocked by, that will be like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'd love, be happy to do that for you. And whether, whether it's voiceover or, or guesting with animation, or doing music or, or art, you know, backgrounds and stuff like anything. Um, and, uh, and I think that, I mean, as far as like my, my knack goes for it. Um, I mean, some of it was lessons learned. I mean, for actually from that same era of like, you know, how, of, of learning, like, how do people like to be approached? I think even like when you're trying to break into a business, the lesson that I learned, um, from someone was about how the entertainment business is, is, uh, populated by gatekeepers. Um, and I don't mean that in like a negative way. It's like that's the position that they're mm -hmm. placed in in terms of 
they are you know either a decision maker or they represent a decision maker and it's their job to filter you know the people that are are deemed like you need to be involved with this and these people don't need to be involved with it and i think that when you want to break through that you have to understand how does a gatekeeper how would a gate be a gatekeeper want to be approached um and i think that understanding that level of etiquette about something um here's an example uh mona marshall who is a, a great friend and a lot of people know of, of her as uh, she was izzy and digimon she's a lot of the female characters on south park and uh, she was the lead character in the dot hack video game which dot hack was a huge influence on tom i wanted to get a hold of her and have her do a guest character in one of the episodes so I went to a friend uh, that I worked with who was a radio host and interviewed Mona. And I said, hey, how can I get in touch with Mona? And she said, um, I usually go through people's agencies. So try doing that and see if you can get a hold of her. And I did. Uh, funnily enough, now I'm with that agency, that, that very same one. And um, I reached out to Mona and said, hey, Mona, I'm an independent artist. Um, I really love your work, uh, specifically for your work in as Kite in the Dot .hack video games. I'm making this animated project that was very heavily inspired by Dot .hack. It's a small role, would be maybe an hour of your time, it would mean the world to me to get to work with you. If you'd be interested, let me know. And she got back to me like within a matter of days, and we worked together over Skype. And she, oh, you're moving to LA? Let me know. I'd love to help hook you up with some opportunities. Like, and I'd love to work with you. I, I, I want to produce some animation stuff myself. And I'm like, oh my God, wow. And that was just from like reaching out and being professional and cool about it, um, you know, being professional during the recording session that we had, and she did this little uh, character in one of the episodes, and uh, and then you know we've had a friendship for nine years now, and um, and she's great, and and like that's you know a lot of cases have been like that, um, you know, with people that are are a lot of which are my very good friends, and I, I work with and see you know all the time every other week or so, uh, so sometimes it's as simple as that. There, it's it's not you know. If I dig to try and find like what's what's my what is my secret like I don't know I just I just approach people and usually they're cool about it so so the big thing that I know and I I actually it's so crazy because I am I did not I remember I vaguely remember who Kerbifer was when I invited you but mostly I knew you from your voice acting career and then I was like oh I was like he was the news ground guy that he did like he did like the the, the brawl taunts and he did the, this and he did that I was like oh my gosh it is uh, it was so yeah. weird it was yeah. a blast from the past it, it's always funny to see how I like kind of fit into people's lives of like what they know me from specifically because it's like some some corners of the internet it's like the brawl taunts guy and some people are like oh Alex from Y2K and like oh like home or oh you know mob psycho or or you know what have you like it's always a different thing with people or or you know oh, the mario rpg thing etc and it, it's it's fascinating to see like the differences and like what when i meet someone i go oh i know who you are and i'm like what do you know me from <laughs> is always what i want to know first and foremost so yeah no that's kind of a nice feeling though it is it feels nice to be appreciated mm -hmm. your thing about the gatekeeper though makes sense uh I don't even know how I got into it, but I'm in a bunch of Facebook groups for voice acting and it's like full, just full to the brim of people trying to break into that industry. I swear it's like thousands, if not tens of thousands of people are trying to do what you do. So when you wow. said that about there has to be gatekeepers, that's kind of what I'm thinking of. It's like there are so many people that want to get into this. That would mean that someone has to uh, has to make f figure out who could be in here, who isn't. And that doesn't always, I think, come out fair to people. But that, you know, that's just reality. That's that's life. What you're going to do. How did you move from guy on news ground, does some animation. You even worked with Skullgirls at one point, I believe. But that's, I did, yeah. That's a whole yeah, other yeah, yeah. thing right now. Right. Uh, how did you move from all that kind of stuff to being like professional voice actor? What, what, what was the flip? How did you get your uh, your chance, your big chance? How did that happen for you? Well, so if I don't have a traditional acting background. I did not do theater or radio or stand up or any of that stuff. I was I was an animator first and foremost, and uh, I did voices for some of my own things. And probably around, um, I guess, probably middle school for me, uh, I learned about voice actors and got really intrigued by them. And I and I became 
you know, like I, I became this big encyclopedia of who all of them were. You know, there was this website, TV Tome, um, which was where I met all the people that the Tome characters were like originally based on way, way back on the first incarnation. And it was kind of like a, a Wikipedia ish um, sort of site that had like information on every TV show and movie, including all the staff and actors. And that's where I learned, oh, the guy who voices SpongeBob is also like Dog from Cat Dog and all this, you know, et cetera. And I started building that up. And then I was finding like behind the scenes stuff, commentaries and, you know, interviews and things with different voice actors and really finding that fascinating. And so I was kind of just studying like, why? Oh, okay. What makes this performance good? And what's, what makes this performance bad? Like, why do I love this, but I don't love this? And, um, so I became really studious of it. And then when I started doing voices for my own stuff, that was kind of what I was taking and integrating into that um, was, uh, was, was trying to uh, try to use what I had learned uh, with someone that didn't have like a performance background um, to determine what makes a good performance that is funny or believable or dramatic or, or effective in eliciting whatever it needs to elicit from the audience, right? And, and having that uh, in tandem with creating and writing and animating my own stuff that went with it um, kind of helped guide that a bit. Then uh, my opportunity was I was starting to go to conventions. I would meet people. Um, a lot of people in the business, uh, not well, a few people in the business sort of knew who I was already. Um, because I was known on the internet for various things and they knew me, you know, some of them knew me from like forums, Chris Bevins actually, who's a great ADR director and he's uh, a friend as well. Um, he, uh, he knew me from a forum that, you know, some of the industry folks would go to, to kind of get feedback from people about like when new anime dubs would come out and say, Hey, what'd you guys think? And Hey, here's some of the, you know, cast and stuff. And just, you know, but, um, I went to a convention and there were two ADR directors uh, in New York that were hosting it. And um, that there, there, was a, there was a panel they were doing where you'd come up, it was like a contest where you'd come up and do a monologue and then you'd have to improv and then you would have to dub a scene, right? And uh, I went to this contest on a whim and I won it. Uh, and the prize was supposed to be that you get a part in one project that those two uh, directors were working on. Um, one of them was going back and forth between New York and, and L.A. a lot, so they didn't have anything. And the other one uh, was uh, directing Pokemon at the time. This was back when Diamond and Pearl uh, was the season that was being uh, dubbed. And so, um, but I couldn't just be given a part. I had to earn it and audition for it like any other actor, which frankly I prefer because I... I think that if I had just been given like a little one episode quick, you know, one and done thing, um, then I would have, I would have not had a career. Um, because when I was called in for my, my very first audition was for the character Riley, uh, the guy with the Lucario in Diamond and Pearl, uh, which I did not get. Uh, but I remember the director said, I know that we owe you because of that contest, but like, I wouldn't really call you, call you in for the show if I didn't think you were good. And I was like, wow. Uh, okay. So uh, I met an, it had been a whole year since I won that contest. And then I had another audition, which turned out to be for Corey, uh, who is this character that was representing the, um, the gold and silver remake that was coming out of the DS at that time. So I went and I did that, uh, booked the part, did five episodes of the show. And I was like, oh my God, I did my, you know, my, I just got my dream show I, but that I grew up with and I'm good. Uh, but then other opportunities came up. I was getting recommended by other people for video game stuff in New York. Uh, some things from Holm. Um, then I started working for NYV Post. Uh, did some stuff with them in New York. And then eventually I moved out to LA in 2014. And I had a lot of people like Mona, who I mentioned, and like Ben Diskin and Yuri Lowenthal, who helped, you know, shop me around to places, to different studios. And I had my little demo and everything. Um, and, uh, I just started getting more auditions. I did Tales of Zestiria right around when I moved and, uh, uh, Low on the Sea and Disgaea 5 and stuff, you know, a whole bunch of different things. Um, then OKKO OK and Cartoon Network worked out, 
uh, because Ian Cordy remembered me and called me in to be a, like a utility player for a bunch of characters and things, which was... That is interesting. What did he remember you from, from your news ground days or from No, Pokemon, well, or... so this this was crazy. Okay, so Ian Cordy, those of you who don't know Ian Cordy, he's uh, the, the creator of OKKO OK and the voice of Radit Lee's and many other characters, and he was yeah, also was one of the co... Yeah, a big Cartoon Network animator. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Worked on Venture Brothers and Secret Four Mount Awesome, and he was, uh, he was also one of the co-exec producers on uh, Steven Universe. Great, great guy. He was... A substitute teacher uh, for one of my animation classes in college. He was subbing in while our main animation teacher, Celia Bullwinkle, was a great uh, animator as well. She was out one day and she called in Ian to teach us. I knew of Ian for an old Flash animation series he did called Knock For, uh, that he did back in the, two th in the mid, mid 2000s. And um, so I met him there. And then I would run, and also Rebecca Shooker, who created Steven Universe, she uh, she was two years ahead of me at school, so I knew her from school as well. Um, and they both kind of went out to LA around the same time, and they were doing all their animation stuff. Steven Universe and OKKO, OK when it was called Lakewood Plaza Turbo, got pilots picked up around the same time, uh, and I think 2013 or so, maybe a little earlier than that. So uh, I would see them at conventions. I would catch them at like Anime Expo once in a while, and we'd talk for a little bit, you know. And then I remember when I did Tales of Hysteria, and that came out in 2015, and that was my first like big title that I got to be part of, uh, you know, like when I moved to LA. Um, and I remember Ian commenting on that, and he was like, "Dude, that's awesome. Good for you." Months passed. the The series for OKKO OK was just about to start gearing up. They were doing these shorts uh, and an iPad game, uh, kind of to sort of begin the. It was kind of this multimedia sort of experimental thing Cartoon Network was doing. And one day, uh, I get a, a DM from Ian uh, on Twitter, and he's like, "Are you uh, are you in the union? Because I, I want you on my show." And I'm like, "Uh, what?" And this is not how this usually happens, by the way. So I join the union, and I get an agent, um, and uh, I'm I'm in the booth, and I go into Cartoon Network, and I'm I'm there with Jim Cummings and David Herman from Futurama, and Mary Elizabeth McGlynn and Ashley Birch, and I'm and me, and I'm like. What is my life? What am I doing here? And it was just, I get it, it was as simple as Ian was like, well, I saw you were doing voice stuff. And I'm like, yeah, Chris does a lot of cool character voices and stuff. He'd be good to do like, I did like five or six different guys in KO. I did about like 20 to 30 episodes of 100 or so that we did of that show. And uh, that was one of the greatest joys of my life was getting to be part of that series. So, Oh, no, I... I liked OK KO. I feel a little bad for that show because it was it came out just as the the big attention for Cartoon Network was winding down. So I kind of felt like it didn't get quite as much attention as maybe it deserved. It's got its fan base. I think a lot of people enjoy it. And you know, and even like I know we we wanted to do a lot more uh, with it. You know, we did, but we, 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 we had a good. I mean, three seasons is also still a pretty good run. And like um, the staff worked hard to, to fit all the ideas that they wanted to do into the final season as much as possible. And thankfully, cause it's, you know, it's kind of a wacky show, like the kind of haphazard pace still worked for it. And, uh, I was just, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. And, and I got to be there from pretty much beginning to end, uh, of, of the, of the full series. And, um, you know, all the actors I got to work with, it was just a tremendous honor to, to be a, and I would always, I would always go over to the animation building and I would, See what the staff was cooking up. I learned about the Sonic crossover episode before they were doing it. And I was like, whoa, I can't wait to see that, you know. <laughs> and um, yeah, I, just, I, I missed that show dearly. And, uh, you know, but Ian and all, all the staff, you know, Parker, uh, um, who was, he's now the creator of uh, Mau Mau, uh, you know, he was, he was one of the artists on that show as well. Um, a lot of people have gone on to do other great things at this point. So, you know. So how did you, the, the role, I think, that you are most known for is probably for Mob Psycho, though you were yeah, recently yeah. in the Black Clover film and you have had uh, mid to big parts. Like you were the lead on the Godzilla. There were like three animated yeah, Godzilla, Godzilla films. anime yeah. trilogy. That was a lot of fun too. I love those movies. I've had some good ones. I mean, Hunter Hunter was a good, big one. Yeah, you, you play from... the uh, evil butterfly dude. Yes, Chowapu from the King's Royal Guards. Um, he was great. I mean... You know, I've gotten to do little small characters on like some of the big shonen stuff. I mean, you know, I've done Dragon Ball, I've done One Piece, I've done Naruto. Um, you know, and like that, that's, I know that those are small characters, but it's still just, just to get to be in them. Sailor Moon, I did Pegasus and, and the redub we did of the original series was a, a tremendous honor. Um, and, uh, but yeah, Mob Psycho, I mean, yeah, for, for sure. I mean, Reagan is probably not going to be topped for like, and you know what? And, and I mean, he's a great, 
great character to be associated with because he's just so much fun and everybody loves him and he's such a big highlight of the show um and uh, and and I'm a big fan of the show personally anyway like I I I love it I really really genuinely love Mop Psycho so it's you know but there's worse things to be associated with really No it's a great role you you did a good job it stands up I I th- uh there are only a handful of roles like that where I think they they you know that I watch it and then years later I'm thinking about it again yeah like, yeah that was really yeah. you know it's kind of like um uh the, like almost all the cast of cowboy bebop for example those are oh, like sure those are yeah. performances that you know you're like wow mm-hmm. it, absolutely it holds with you uh so how did you you know i maybe people are tired to hear about voice acting i don't know how did you get the role of uh reagan era talking what did you do to uh prepare were you aware of the manga or the japanese sub before that so I had known One Punch Man. I had auditioned for all the big characters in One Punch Man. Never got on the show, um, and I, I knew vaguely that there was another series by uh, One Sensei that was after that. And I vaguely remember seeing this dude in a suit who looked like Ichigo from Bleach if he did if he kind of like pushed his hair down with a whole lot of Aquanet, and uh, that was all I knew. And I uh, I was told actually by a friend of mine about how uh, oh there's this character and this show that you'd be really good for. And I'm like, I don't want to get my hopes up. And like, and I don't, you know, I don't often play lead guys in a lot of these kind of shows. I'm usually like, you know, little side dudes or whatever. And uh, so I get the audition. And uh, and it was, you know, like, I'm sure you've probably heard this a lot too, but it really was as simple as just, it was an audition and I got it. Um, I don't know how, how many other people I might've been up against for that part. I imagine probably a fair amount. Um, but I, uh, I just, you know, did two takes of him and I, uh, the, the, on the audition, it was, um, the two scenes were a him on the phone yelling at mob to not give into the, the, the telepathy club. Like, oh, they're just trying to get you to join their club, like see through it mob. Uh, and then the other one was, um, giving the, uh, the one customer like a, like the, the sorcery. Uh, the massage and everything. Yeah, one it of Reagan's the, special moves. This is one of Reagan's special techniques. I, yeah, so I did those two parts, um, sent it in, and then I got it. Uh, and the full first season of the show was out, so I watched it in Japanese uh, and got you know familiar with all the material. And we probably spent about eight hours of recording on the first episode because I have so many lines. And we had uh, Mami Okada, the uh, casting director there. We had a rep from Crunchyroll, um, pre-merger kind of Crunchyroll way back. Uh, what year was that? We did Bob Psycho was 2016 or 17, I think we did. Yeah, the first um, season comes out in 2016, I think. Yeah, yeah. So we had everybody there and Chris Kaysen, who was our ADR director for the first and second season, um, who I uh, worked with, I think, before that on a couple of things as well. And uh, we just went to town, and we had Mike McFarland uh, writing it as well. And they had done, uh, Mike and Chris had done One Punch Man as well. So they wanted some of the same staff. And um, and there were even a couple of Ayo Max Metalman, who was Saitama, was in Mob Psycho as well. There were a few crossover uh, cast members there. And uh, and I just had a ball. You know, we we, we blasted through those episodes and, um, you know, had them come out week to week. And it blew up. And the fact that it was a dub that was so beloved by people really meant a lot to me because I was understanding that, you know, with the convenience of simul dubbing and, and simulcasting and everything, uh, there was uh, there was a lot of this stuff happening with like, you know, people that even people that liked dubs. But if a show would come out and there'd be the, you know, the sub episode and maybe they didn't want to wait, they'd be they wouldn't wait. Be like, oh, I'll just. I'll just watch this, whatever mm-hmm. it's out. I'll watch out now. And if they didn't like the show that much, they wouldn't have much reason to go and watch it again in English. But with Mob Psycho, the show was already popular. And then the dub turned out really well and people loved it. And then by the time I remember the second season, there were a lot of people I was keeping an eye on, like Reddit and various places. They were like, I'm going to wait until the dub comes out for season two before I watch it. And that is not a thing that people do these days. That's very, very rare for people to do that. I, I do that with like, like I, I wait for the dub episodes of uh, My Hero and Doctor Stone to come out. I don't, I don't watch it in Japanese. I usually wait till the dub happens. And um, uh, but, but I understand that for most people, they don't, they don't want to wait. They just want to see it like immediately. And if they like it enough that they'll watch the dub later, maybe they will, maybe they won't. 
Um, so yeah, the the adoration that people had for for that show and for the dub specifically, not even just my work, but just the entire because everybody did a great job. Uh, there's there's there was like nobody in that dub did a bad job as far as I'm concerned. And uh, yeah, so it's it's lasted, you know, a long time at this point. I mean, put the math on that, seven years at this point. Uh, people have really loved it, and uh, and I really appreciate it. So. Yeah, no, it's it's good. I was watching it last night to ready for the interview. Uh, my mom was visiting and she watched and she does not like anime. So, but she was even enjoying it. So I was like, okay, well, maybe he did a good job. Maybe it's just not, maybe it's not just me if one of the normies likes this too. It crosses the border between normal and anime. I think, it, you, know, you know what, it's funny because I think it is a very accessible kind of show. You know, it's not, and because it's not too long, it's not too insane or anything necessarily um and it's just a fun time just a good 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 time that show you know? definitely definitely uh season three they were on a able to bring back um the original the original voice actor yeah. that was playing uh kageyama uh w i read that was like a union thing is this was it something yeah, like that it was it was a whole unfortunate issue and uh kyle mccarley who is the original voice of mob is a good friend of mine uh, I care about him very much, and uh, I understood his decision. I, I decided to take the offer to come back because um, they approached us all to reprise our parts. And um, because it was such a, I mean, this, the short version is because it was such um, an important character to me and, and the show was very important to me, I decided to come back. And um, we all, everybody all in the cast, we all talked about it, uh, you know, a lot about when those negotiations were going on. And, um, you know, there was there was there was no judgment between anybody. We, were, we all love each other very much and we're all colleagues and friends and we work together on other projects and things. And, um, you know, and I mean, Kyle is like on fire with his career. You know, um, I was very sad, of course, to not have my mob with me uh, in the third season, um, you know, but uh, but like I, I'm 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 proud of Kyle for just doing his thing, sticking to his guns and uh, and, and making a great career for himself like a, a He's um he's on the show Monkey Kid, which I'm if no one if those of you listening if you've not seen Lego Monkey Kid please do yourself a favor and watch that show it's incredible and Kyle plays uh this really bratty um kind of uh like like pseudo sort of villain but I feel like he's kind of leading towards the good side named uh, Red Sun uh and he's just hysterical it's so good um he does a great job on that and um you know and getting to work on the third season was still even even though the circumstances were not perfect obviously because of the situation it was still great to work on it i worked with caitlin glass uh, who was our adr director for um third season and she was one of the very first people in the business i ever met she's wonderful and she you know just tried to do her best with taking on the show and everything and uh you know there were a lot of people that did come back and some people that didn't um for the same reasons that kyle didn't and uh you know so yeah, it's not a perfect run all the way through, and that is a shame. I mean, that's happened with a lot of shows that uh, that I've been a fan of too. It's happened with Dragon Ball and Pokemon and Sonic multiple times. We're like, and now suddenly the voices are different, and etc. So I understand the frustration with that with fandom too, and it's 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 a bummer. But you know, we just we just all try to do our best with things and make light of every situation we can. So the the business side of it for voice acting is is like a lot of creative endeavors it seems like it's very similar to what we're seeing with the writer strike yeah. um yeah a lot of crossover know, there for sure I, there is definitely and maybe you i'd be interested to hear this your thoughts on this because there seems to be one of the issues with the writer strike they're facing right now is of course the rise of ai and it's looking at the value of artistic workers artistic content where from the business side and these aren't sometimes the business people do love whatever the the medium is that they're working not always though and many of them are like well can we you know could computers just do all this for us like like what's the what's the trade-off here like yeah, maybe maybe the quality is a little diluted but we'll make oodles of money what what's your feelings on this stuff with ai where how do you or your fellow voice actors feel like the horizon for what you're trying to do crunchy roll which is now owned by funimation which is now owned by crunchy roll which is now owned by sony well yeah yeah crunchy roll is basically the the new crunchy roll is basically funimation absorbed crunchy roll and they've all kind of merged together and, and all that and then the headquarters is the dallas uh, studio and all that stuff as far as i as, as far as i understand 
um, and they're all, you know, working together. And, um, you know what, I mean, like, well, to speak with about them as well, like, they're just working hard to, you know, bring everybody the best that they can bring, you know, um, and, uh, and trying to, you know, keep up with a market that's constantly evolving and changing. And um, I think that when it comes to, you know, a lot of creative departments like that, whether it be Crunchyroll or Netflix or Viz uh, or Amazon, I think that I would like to hope that all of them are like, no, we want entertainment by human beings. You know, I, I as I'll be as devil's advocate about this, uh, devil's advocate about this. There we go. Um, I'm sure that there are uses for artificial intelligence in art and creative stuff that can be useful and helpful to people. But I don't think it will ever, and I don't ever want it to be a replacement for a real human performance. You know, I watch, um, you talked about One Piece earlier. I'm watching the, the episodes that Crunchy have been putting out of the Wano arc. And I'm just, for 20 years or however long it's been at this point, close to it, of hearing these, av you know, Colin Plinkenbeard and all the, the cast doing these characters. And I'm like, I never get tired of this. I never, and, and, and the, on the other side, the animation that the people at Toei, like a lot, of, I believe it's a lot of the guys that did the the Broly uh, Dragon Ball Super movie a couple of years ago that are doing the episodes of One Piece and they're getting Ian Cordy calling back to that. He yes. just started to do animation for one of the recent episodes of One Piece. I saw that on Twitter. Like yeah. They're having people from all over and it's just incredible. And I'm like, then I see like, you know, some of these AI things and I'm like, no, I don't, there's no replacing like, this stuff that is made by all these hardworking, dedicated, extremely skilled human beings that I, like I, I aspire to be, you know, um, it's it just blows my mind uh, to see that. And um, and so, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't want I don't want us to get replaced by algorithms and, and you know, what what robotics that are trained to think that we want or need or whatever i don't you know i'd rather i'd rather kind of figure it out i'd rather us all as we you know grow up and and, and become creators and you know choose to do this with our lives that we just you know figure out what is the human can do like even you know what weird kind of full circle thing as well but like um as i became a storyteller and i started you know making different projects and things you know even like the three different incarnations of tome that i've made Right. Um, I, uh, I wanted to figure out what am I saying with this story? Right. And with each version, I got closer and closer to figuring that out. And it wasn't until I did the tone video game that I realized, oh, I'm telling a story about trust. That's, that's the, that, that uh, now I have impetus. And that was my guiding light for writing the story of the, the RPG that we created uh, a couple of years ago. And, uh, and I loved how it turned out because once I had that as the core theme of like, it's trust and how different people deal with that, that, uh, was really like, this is, this is what I want to be the impact that it leaves on people. This is what I want my work to do for people. You know what I mean? Um, and, uh, and even the stuff I'm working on right now, I think about like, yeah, it's the same thing that I want. I want these things to be, to leave a positive impact. Um, and it's the same thing with my voice works, the same thing with when I'm writing for people, it's the same thing with when I'm reading and drawing and animating and, and making a full, you know, product of something. That's what I want. Um, and, uh, I don't know. I don't think that, I don't think that AI can reproduce that personally. So I, I hear you and I am, I am skeptical because I work in news and I, I have seen lots of people be replaced recently. I'm a little, I'm a little concerned because I'm like, uh now that's my hope that's that's my great white hope uh is um is that 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 we won't be placed that's what i want but who knows you know i don't make a lot of those decisions you know from the powers that be of, of any of any shame but, you know. I, I i think voice acting the advantage you have though is that people are very much tied to listening to your voices and they want to know it's authentic whereas in news it's less about I mean, there are a few people where it is about the person, but generally it's about the content. And so the trade-offs there are way different. I I think I see a lot of the technology and it does excite me for the future. And you being a geek, I'm sure you have some of those feelings as well. It's it's like I love uh, or used to love the Big Finish Doctor Who audios, which I don't know if you're familiar with, but basically Big Finish is this British 
company that was it took grabbed all the old actors from the original Doctor Who shows. Okay. So they like Tom Baker, for example, and then yep. they would they would have them uh, do new stories. Of course, they're audio only. Now that technology. Now the problem is though, Tom Baker, who is in his eighties, <laughs> well, one day Tom Baker will not be with us, and that will be a problem for Big Finish. Now Big Finish has tried to record as many things as they possibly can. That's my understanding. But by the same token, you know there are a lot of people who can do decent impersonations, and there would be that temptation, I think, to be like, okay. Let's get our decent impersonation. Let's get our AI Tom Baker, put it together. And but I and I'm like, okay, that's kind of cool. But then it's also kind of creepy. It's like what we're seeing now with with the Disney or WB who decide they wanted to use Christopher Reeve in their uh, new Flash film. And it's like, I don't know. I like it's getting to a comfortable level where I'm like, this is get, I'm getting a little uncomfortable here. Yeah, this is getting the the necro or, like Dar- or like the Darth Vader thing, you know, with James Earl Jones a little while ago. I'm just like. You know, that's your decision, but I mean, I, I'd rather it just be like, you know, any of the two or three different voice actors that have, you know, when, when James Earl Jones doesn't do Darth Vader, like for video games or, you know, animated stuff or anything, I'd rather it just be one of those guys to just, you know, do an impression. Like even, you know what, here's something, a perspective of mine that changed. Whenever I'd see like fan-made content and, and you know, like impressions videos and things, like I'm such a snob about that where I'm just like, yeah, it's okay, I guess, whatever. You know what? I'd rather a, a, a bad impression um, because at least it's a human being just like having fun and experimenting around as opposed to like, let me take, you know, samples of Sonic's voice and then make this AI thing without their permission or without any kind of whatever. Like it's just, it's dangerous, you know? And it's, it's just, it's, it's disrespectful. It's uncool. You know, I, I've had a couple cases like that where that's happened and I've asked people like, hey, would you please, would you mind taking it down and not doing that again. And usually people are like, I'm so sorry about that. You know, this is very, you know, try to them to be understanding of that. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I will say, um, there are people in our industry that are fighting to protect us, to make sure that, you know, there are changes made and there's protection put in place, um, so that we are not, uh, mistreated and, you know, misused. And our our property, our our identities are not you know misused and for anything, um, because yeah, it's, sometimes it can be a little bit of a wild west with things. But um, so I just try to hope for the best. And I mean, all I can do is just con- continue to contribute human made arts to the world in whatever form I can, and hope that people will enjoy it. <laughs> no, I hear you. It it is a kind of a it's a it's an amazing time we're living in, but it's also the future is. Very uncertain, especially for things that are artistic. Now, one of, the, you, one of the other things that you do, you are also a game designer in the sense that you, you, you would help with voice work or you were an animator. You've also made your own animated web series, and then that later got turned into a video game. Is being, is being a professional animator everything you hoped it would be when you were, you, when you were a little 15-year-old Chris and you were making your uh, Power Rangers parody video? <laughs> Well, it's funny because, I mean, I, I know that I always wanted to create things, um, but being an animator specifically was not like the ultimate goal. It's really more of just a, a piece of the bigger puzzle. You know, like I, um, when I was a kid, I, I dreamed of, you know, making my own shows and movies and games and things. And, um, but I, I wasn't going to sit around and wait for, you know, somebody to give me a you know million dollars and make something. So I, I strove to learn every part of the process that I possibly could, um, excuse me, to, to do all the stuff that I needed to make those end products. Um, so animation was just a, a, a large part of that, you know, piece of the puzzle. And, um, like I mentioned earlier, when I got into using flash, it was just a necessity of like, all right, if I'm going to make stuff, then part of how it's got to go, you know? And, um, so I did that and I, uh, I continued to improve and then obviously I went to school for it and everything. And, um, being an animator, it's really just that it's allowed me to do what it is that I want to do ultimately, which is to create an end finished complete product. Um, and I know how to work with other people on all the things that I don't know how to do, you know, or, or I'm not as good at doing, you know? And, um, and, and what I get to do freelance, you know, like, like animation stuff for other people or otherwise, 
Um, it's fun to do, and it's honor. It's an honor to be part of projects like Scroll Girls. That was tons of fun to do that, and very cool that I can point to like, you know, when misfortune, you know, pops her head off and paws around it like it's like a little ball of yarn. I'm like, <laughs> I got to animate that. You know, I got to work with, you know, Mariel Cartwright and like the hundreds of like really amazing cleanup animators and all these people that worked so hard to make that game like extra special and just beautiful looking. You know, um, that that's that's awesome to get to do that. But um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, in terms of like all I dreamed of. Yeah, I didn't dream of it in that way. And to be honest, I mean, like if I if I had so much money to spare, I mean, I would rather, you know, pay other people to do animation for me and, and just, you know, work with them on what I need. Like, um, you know, I've done that with character design and background environment design, sorts of music, all sorts of things. And uh, I love working at a team. That's uh, one of the biggest joys of doing this, you know? No, definitely. And I can... You know, getting, you know, interviewing you, for example, you know, I've been a geek and a nerd all my life. When I get to interact with, you know, people that I've admired or their work and you get engaged in that content, it does feel special because you have a great appreciation. I'm sure that's a lot of it is how it is for you because you grew up, for example, I know you're a huge Mega Man kind of Nintendo fan. You're kind of in that area. And I, one of the interesting things I noticed that you did with uh, Tome the Video Game is you were able to track down the guy that did the Mega Man X voice, I believe. And I don't uh, think I've heard him since. That's No, no. Uh, no it was, um, I had the, <laughs> I had the voice of Mega Man from uh, Mega Man 8, uh, who was like the, like the, the, Bass, why are we fighting? We are not enemies. I found her. She was in Japan, Ruth Shirishi, uh, Ruth German. Um, and also uh, the voice of Zero from Mega Man X Eight. Uh, yeah, that, that's the, sorry. Yeah, no, that that's that's yeah. That was, that's yeah Lucas yeah. Lucas Gilbert said yeah. Who he's still doing? He and uh, he and his partner Caroline Day. They're still doing voice for a voiceover work up in uh, Calgary. They're great people, and they're actually they're making video games and stuff now themselves. Uh, really cool stuff. But uh, yeah, Lucas is awesome. I met Lucas many years ago, and uh, he's a great voice actor and tons of fun. And he loves Zero and everything. So you know. I don't, I, 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 uh, the kind of games you like seem similar to me where it's kind of a hate love relationship because it's like, you know, are we ever going to see actually new Mega Man games? I am not certain. Hey, you know what? Look, we had Mega Man 11 a few years ago, which was a victory, and uh, Battle Network Legacy Collection appears to be very, very successful. So there's clearly still a, mar a mega market that exists out there, and I hope that maybe we'll, we'll be lucky enough because uh, you know what? Capcom has a lot of people were very, very understandably critical of Capcom for a long time. And it seems like now they're doing very, very good stuff. Um, and people are a lot happier with them. And, and you know, so uh, I don't, well, who, who they're, knows? They're, who the knows remakes what, are what good. They've had, they yeah. have, these last two years has been really quite good. In the mm. I feel Fair. like they just want to punish people because uh, KG Afuni left. Uh, uh, Afuni, whatever. You know, Inafune. Yeah, Inafune I was son, so yeah. disappointed when they canceled Legends 3. That was the only yeah. reason they even bought a 3DS. And then it was like, yeah. what? I was waiting for the demo. The demo was like, oh, the demo's going to come out right during E3. Yeah. I was getting ready. I was like, oh, is well, it there yet? Is it there and, yet? I mean, Inafune Sans off doing his own thing. And, uh, you know, it seems like the fact that we've had a resurgence of Capcom, uh, of Mega Man stuff from Capcom, it seems like maybe some of that smoke is clearing a little bit i would like to help i mean you know we'll, we'll never know like the full details of those relationships and politics and everything like it's not our business to know unfortunately but but i but i i'm hopeful you know what at the very least i'm grateful for a battle network legacy collection because i was so happy to get to play those games again and share them with a whole generation of people that didn't get to play them before um and uh and i you know i love venti warrior and all that stuff but to hear andrew francis as mega man of the menu system again was such a joy so uh, you know what, like there's you, you take you take the good as you know where you can get it, and uh, and I and like I said, I'm I'm hopeful maybe we'll get some stuff. That and also, I mean, like not Capcom related, but it's just like I'm still over here being like we're getting a Mario RPG remake. What is my life like? Oh, it's real. Like wow. So I I have I have loads of retro now retro things I wish they would bring back, but you yeah. know. It, you're right. There are these remakes. There, there does some, seem to be more recognition that this is a viable market. So who knows? Who knows? One comment I really liked, and this is kind of one thing I wanted to say for this interview. You made in the Pipkin, I keep, whatever, the bun. In her interview, 
you, you, she was asking you about, you know, like how actors or voice actors are very shallow because you guys were talking about theater kid energy. And you made the, the, the comment that you said, actually, people generally have it wrong, that they think that people who are actors or voice actors in entertainment, that, that they're very dramatic and that they're very fake. But your point was actually it's the opposite. The, the issue here is that they actually they they feel almost too much. They're very much into these things. And so that kind of comes off differently to people. Could you if you're comfortable, could you expound upon that? Because it's so interesting because you start you're like you start like me. You're like a big fan. And now you're working all the things that you kind of wanted to be sort of involved in and you're getting to do all the things. But you also get to meet the real the real people, the, the, the actual story underneath it all. And so hearing your insights to what that is actually like, getting to live your dream, is really interesting to me. I, I think maybe it's interesting to my audience as well. I think it goes back to the same thing I was talking earlier about, like, um, everybody has a misconception about, like, oh, it's, you know, it's all nepotism, but it's like, no, it's a community. Um, yeah, I think, um, I don't know. I, I think that the fakeness, people that are really, like, genuinely fake, like, just, like, jerks. They don't last. They don't last long. You know, no matter how talented they might be, they're they're if that's the energy that they give off, people don't want to work with them. You know, um, I think that most people, most people I've met in this business, uh, even just specifically voiceover, are so kind and so cool, and they're good friends. And yeah, what I was kind of joking about uh, was that like, no, I don't think anybody's fake. If anything, most of the people that I know get really and myself included get so real you know i just met um i, I was at a party a couple days ago i met uh bill Millsap, who's a great voice director uh i'd never met him before um and he's uh, as a voice actor as well he's worked on jojo's bizarre adventure and like i met him and his partner for like all of 10 minutes and we're already talking about like deeply personal things and i'm like wow and there's a part of me that's thinking like am i getting like way too real having known this person for like you know, a millisecond, but no, it was like very comfortable and, you know, et cetera. Um, and it was nice that like, sometimes you have those kind of just immediate connections to people, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I think that's, uh, maybe also a, a, a certain perception. Cause even I see this sometimes is like when, when people go to conventions, um, there's a level of like, have to be like ultra, ultra, ultra respectful and excuse me, and empathetic to everyone because and and I don't see that as like, oh, I have to put a face on, I have to be fake or whatever. I think it's out of you just want to be very respectful and kind and grateful to fans, you know? Um, I could understand, say, if like, you know, I try to be pretty real with people when I when I meet them at cons and stuff, but like if if I was like, Hi, it's great to meet you. Oh, thank you so much for watching my show. I could understand like looking at that and being like, Are you just like being hyper polite to me right now because like are you on like some sort of pedestal and like I'm below you or whatever I could see people maybe interpreting that in a different way um but I think that it's just because like and there's been so many cases where sometimes like okay here's a case of people being too real if like you get like a celebrity and they're just like all right yeah whatever here's my autograph all right next you know like that's yeah they're being real but they're not being very nice you mm -hmm. know um, and those are also, I think that those are pretty rare cases personally, like most people are just about things. Um, but, but also on even maybe a grander scale than, than everything I'm saying is like, it's, it's just different from person to person, you know, like I'm generalizing a lot from my personal experience because most people I've interacted with are just cool, you know, and very, and it goes back to, again, it's like when, when, um, when I was, you know, assembling everybody for, the tone, uh, you know, the, the web series and the video game and et cetera. Uh, it was all just people that I could call it and be like, you down to work on this thing? It's like, yeah, done. The end. Right. Um, and that came from those friendships and those relationships being built up for all that time, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, and I look at that and I think that that's great. So, but that's my personal experience. Everybody has a different one. There are some people, um, like actually a friend of mine who was just kind of like sick of it. He was just like, I think I want to move away from LA. I just am not happy here. I'm like, that's totally fine, man. Like, if you're going to be happier somewhere else with with your wife, you can be away from from all this and maybe still work from home if you you know if you get opportunities. Great, absolutely. 
Um, but there's nothing wrong with like, I, I mean, I, I, I would be sad that your personal experience is like, you're not enjoying the dynamic out here and you, it doesn't make you happy, but that's also valid to not want to be part of it. Cause that's your personal experience, you know? Um, and I got some flack from like Pippa's chat during that part where everybody's like, God, you're so neutralist or, oh, like, why would you let, like, yeah. like, but that's like, and I, I like, you know what? I get where that comes from too, but it's like that, that really is my thought is I'm just like. I, I just I just try to have fun and I just try to enjoy myself and the people that I see the most that are my close friends that are you know in this entertainment world are people that I trust a lot and uh, and we all just want to have a good time and do good work and and hopefully pay the bills so <laughs> yeah no I I agree I think your approach is right I the one thing I do love about voice acting and I have major respect for for people who are like this because you're in your position you play Reagan and maybe there's someone out there that's having a really hard time and they see your performance they watch the show it really sticks with them and they um, they like oh I'm so excited to meet him at the I'm going to see Chris at the con I really want to tell him how much he you know all the stuff that he meant to me and of course you've never met that person that's a lot of things to put on you so of course you, you want to be friendly you want to be polite because you don't know what your interaction is going to mean to that person um, but doing that kind of thing isn't necessarily for everyone. I think one of the things that I've learned working in journalism, and I didn't understand this when I was younger, yes, there is trolling. Yes, there are people that are playing for clicks. But I think the problem we're seeing, even with the culture war and all the tension we see at places like Twitter, there's this assumption that the other side doesn't actually believe or, or doesn't doesn't really feel the things that they're saying or doing. When it, that's not the that's not the truth. In my experience, that's why. Journalists sometimes get offended if people make a negative comment. It's not because they're fake. It's because they're very real and they feel it. And I wish if people approached it more like like you were saying, where you're you're mindful of like how we see each other may not be the same, what values we might take away from each other might be the same, and show a little bit of kindness. I think that would change things a lot. And that is something I've noticed along with voice acting that uh, I really appreciate. And maybe it's because a lot of voice actors came, you know, you said, you've said multiple times, like how you were bullied as a kid. And so maybe those experiences taught you to be more empathetic. But it's something I kind of wish there was a lot more of in the world, just personally and professionally. I do too. But you know what? It's funny. Like I see often this comments, uh, I, this is a recent epiphany I had where people are like, why can't everybody just be good to each other? Is it so difficult to be a good person? And it's like, you know what? Yes, it's it takes work to be a good person. It takes effort and energy to be a good person. And like, what I consider, I think people throw on like bad person a little too. Bad bad people are like you know serial killers and criminals, mm -hmm. and, you know, etc. Like to me, most people are just people. You know, most of them are just people. And then you meet like really, really good people that are just super like giving and altruistic and, and wonderful. And they're the dime a dozen, but that's what makes them like really special, like, you know, connections that you have in your life is when you meet those people. And, and I, and I think it's the same thing. It's like, we just do our best to be good. Sometimes it isn't enough for, you know, whoever is in our peripheral, but you just try. You know, um, so some people then then some people just get tired and they don't and then they just kind of live. Um, and if that's easy for them, then then that's OK. Um, but. Anything can be as difficult as you make it to be. Um, and uh, and you never know what any again, anybody's personal, you know, shoes that they walk in. You know, you, you have no idea. You know, you just you just have to be understanding and and, and go through your own the best of your own ability. That's what I've always, you know, tried to do for 34 years of existence. That's what I want to continue to do for the, however, uh, 120 something more years you, of existence. Yes, yes. Hopefully. You said 150, like it, so yeah. Yeah, so it'd be, yeah, curve it for 150. There we go. So, in due time. I No, that's very much a Reagan. <laughs> that's like one of my favorite things about Reagan where he gives the speech to mob. And it's like, like, psycho powers aren't any different than anything one else, you know, because and that was a great thing because I was fishing season one and Reagan, when he has that big climactic battle, his big message to everyone. And that's kind of like the theme of the, the whole uh, mob cycle, really. And then it's like people want to feel like they are so different, that we're so above everything. But the truth is, we're all humans. We're all in the middle of it. Uh, and that's just kind of something you have to learn and accept. It's, it's kind of the beauty of life. But, you know, and you're you the protagonist of your own life. That's right. 
That's right. Um, it's eats his burger. <laughs> He's always so, in, especially when he eats, like they eat like any kind of like burger thing. And in Japan, they do have like the burgers that come in the bags. Yeah, we don't really have here, but they like they, they have like red. That. They have yeah, they have all the stuff around their face. Yeah, that always bugs me. I have a little bit of uh, inclination <laughs> to like go clean yourself up. Well, uh, this was so much fun. I really appreciate this. Yeah, Chris. of what, course. What is next for you? What are you? You want to do another thing with Tome? I think I've read. What are your projects and things you want to do on the horizon? Uh, well, the, my last little thing for Tom coming up. When, when is this uh, interview going live, do you think? Uh, probably two weeks. Okay, so well, by the time this will be out, I will have released the third and final installment of the Tom A to Z trilogy, which was a series of movies where I took the episodes of the Tom 2011 web series and compiled them into three films with new footage uh and uh, this recent one actually has a, an all-new expanded ending that takes place further after where the show ended um so you can check that out i uh i'm going to be uploading the old episodes of tta on my youtube channel at some point as well so that'll be something <laughs> to uh, look back on um i would like to do a new super mario rpg uh music video and uh that's going to be cool to do um, I, I'm in talks with a few people about getting that off the ground at some point. So, and, uh, I've, I'm, I'm writing on a new project, uh, that's coming up, which I'm excited about. And, uh, and also I'm in early stages of, uh, developing a movie, uh, an animated feature film, which is going to be hopefully my next kind of like big, big, big project. It's called Balancing Act. And, uh, it's like my big magnum opus thing. And, uh... Otherwise, and, you know, hopefully if I'm lucky, more voiceover stuff, uh, we'll see. So, um, that's about all. And hopefully, um, getting my body fixed because I injured myself a lot a couple of years ago and I'm still trying to work through that. So maybe if uh -oh. I'm lucky, my arms will work down like normal. Uh-oh. Oh, yeah, you need to take good care of yourself. Have you ever met one? Have you ever worked on a voiceover project and you actually, like, met the creator? I know that I've heard the... People that worked in One Piece did have an opportunity to talk to Oda San, but I don't know if I've heard that very often. That might have been true um, of Cowboy Bebop as well, but the, I, I could be. Wrong I mean, well, that. with OKKO, OK the creator Ian was in the room with us because he was he, in the show he, as boys. Yeah, but he's course. American. Yeah. He like he lives yeah. in L.A. Um, for uh, Japanese creators, I I don't think so. yeah, never never the creator. No, I I remember when I worked on Gundam Origin. Uh, I met one of the head producers at uh, from Sunrise, one of the Japanese producers, I think at Otakon. And uh, I spoke with him about, oh, someday I'd love to, if you guys ever do like a remake of the original Mobile Suit Gundam, I'd love to, you know, do more stuff with Garma. And he, and he was like, oh, you do know that Garma dies. And I'm like, oh, yeah, no, I want to go out in a blaze of glory. Like, I'm excited, you know? Um, oh, he but, was uh, like, he was, he was like, he was terrified. Like, oh, my gosh, he doesn't know. <laughs> That's all I know. I want to be like, let to see on, and then you know, crash and burn, and then set the rest of the show in motion. But uh, yeah, no, I mean, good lord, if I, I, I don't think this will never happen. But I mean, if I ever got to meet Oda-san or Hiro Toriyama, said say, um, I mean, I would be losing my mind, you know, just for how much of an influence they've they've been on me, you know. Um, but uh, but you know, I, in the meantime, just getting to work. On their shows, like that's enough for me. So okay. I am well, very, there very is, supremely honored. There is Reagan Eritaka material that can be adapted. So if you ever do see, for some reason, you fall into a wormhole and you end up meeting one, you're like get on that. <laughs> I mean, I, I know that there's like a Reagan manga that takes place like after the end of the series. Um, I mean, if they ever were to do like an OVA or something of that, I would be all all in on that. That'd be that'd be great. But uh, who knows? We'll see. I mean, we'll uh, maybe someday if I'm if I'm so lucky. Okay, well, I think you have many good things in front of you. I felt like when I listened to that Pipkin, Pip, Pip, I, I, I watch her regularly, so I don't understand yes. why I whatever. Um, I was gonna say one of the things I kind of felt from you were you're kind of hard on yourself a little bit. You're you're like you're like you feel like you know this happens a lot of us when we get in our thirties. You're like, oh, that's it, I peaked. But I don't think that's the case. No, no. I don't think I don't, that's the no, case. No, I don't for feel you, like I peak. No, no, no. I don't feel no, I'm hard on myself like I'm wearing like the like the weighted training clothes, like I'm a Dragon Ball character always in training. But no, no, no. I, I, I don't think I've peaked. I mean, like, um, I'm proud of a lot of these big things that I've gotten to do, but I always want to strive for something bigger and better. And uh, you know, and I and I can only hope that I'll be successful in that. Um, 
But, uh, you know, and, but in the meantime, I just try to enjoy everything, you know, and the journey along the way to, you know, maybe that big success. So. Okay. Well, I hope that's true for all of us. Uh, you can, yeah. of course, you, you can, of course, find Mr. Christopher Kerba, Kerbafer. There we go. I got there it go. right. There you go. Uh, you got yeah, he has a YouTube channel, which you can find by either type again, Chris Neosi or Kerbafer. Uh, you're on Twitter, also Kerbafer. You have your, I don't know if your website is Kerbafer. I don't No, So I have uh, on, on Twitter. I'm at Kerbifer on YouTube. I'm Kerbifer 15 because I made it when I was 15. Uh, I am also Kerbifer 15 on TikTok because I've been doing some stuff on there as well. And my website is Chris Um, which has uh, a whole bunch of stuff that you can check out. It's got voice demos and stuff about Tom and all, all sorts of things. Um, and uh, yeah, that's where you can find me all over the place. And, uh, thanks everybody for listening. I hope that this was entertaining somewhat. <laughs> oh, I, I'm sure I get good feedback all the time. People really seem to enjoy these these interviews. They're a bit more long yeah. form to hear from people. So I appreciate you taking the time, you guys. If you haven't watched Tome, go watch Tome. It's pretty fun. I think it's yeah. In fact, if you're if you're uh, if you haven't seen it before, please check out. Uh, by now, there will be a playlist of the uh, the Tome A to Z trilogy of compilation movies. It's, it's a great way to get into the series if you've never seen it before. Just you know, in a in a, a time of binging that we have now, um, and uh, and if you want to check out the Terrain of Magical Expertise video game on uh, on Steam as well, you can go find that. Um, there's links to that all over all my sites and everything. Peter, thank you for bringing me on. This was a this was a joy, and uh, and and me yeah, too. So I enjoyed it as well, sir. <laughs> I enjoy myself as well. So. <laughs> All right, everyone. Well, this has been fun. Thank you so much for listening. This podcast and YouTube show is helped sponsored and produced by Bain Books Publishing and Young Voices, a journalism organization. Thank you to my wonderful editor, uh, Christopher, uh, different Chris, uh, for all yes. the hard work he puts in. He makes me look much smarter, much more competent than I actually am. And thank you to all you viewers for listening and watching. Until next time, my friends, keep geeking out. <laughs>